Right. Amen. The God of angels on He's always by our side. He sends His angels all ahead of us. We are blessed Amen. to have Him. He has, he has us grow up beyond our feelings to walk in faith, knowing that God goes ahead of us and He plans our day for us. And if we just put it in His hands, we'll have all the fruits of the Spirit manifest. Peace, joy, happiness, patience, self-control, because we know that He's in control. Amen. If you can give control over to Him, we would be all set. The problem is we always try to take control back or we try to help God out like God needs our help. Come on now. The one who created all this needs our help. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he needs our help, all right. No, we need his help so we don't destroy what he gives us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Each and every day. All right, let's start off in our first Corinthians chapter 1 over here. What do we got? Let's see where we're going with this. 26. <laughs>
than the greatest of human strength. Amen. There it is in verse 26. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. When he calls us, usually we're in a broken state. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. He chose the things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one could ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. So we know that the word of God is wisdom, because Christ Jesus is the word. Christ made us right with God, and made us pure and holy, and freed us from our sin. You see, we're free from our sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. How about a big amen there? Amen. Anything that's it's done from here on in after my salvation goes to God, all the glory. I have no power to overcome my sin nature, none. All my flesh, or none of this, has nothing to do with me. All glory goes to who? God. And, and the people that are smart think that the foolish preacher is, has nothing to offer. And God's the one who gives the preacher the power to preach the truth. Amen. And you guys know that because you're sitting here listening to it. Because you know the truth is here. Because yeah. all I'm doing is reading the Word of God. The Word of God is truth. Yes. And we read it, we don't, we don't jump around, we read it all the way through so we understand it. We keep it in context so we understand it so we can learn how to grow, grow and apply it. Amen? All right, let's go to our studies. Anybody remember where we left off? Yes. Ten. <laughs> yep, let's <laughs> start in Job chapter 10. Now, for those that have been involved with this study since the beginning, all I can do is suggest you go back on the website and go back into the study from chapter 1 and get the context of the message. Job is in a complaint mode right now in chapter 10. So we're going to go to Job chapter 10. And we're going to start in verse 1. Everybody got it? Everybody there? All right. This is what he says. I am disgusted with my life. Let me complain freely. My bitter soul must complain. Job, Job was in a bitter state right now. He was hurting, he was suffering, he lost his family, he lost his job, he lost his wealth, he lost his health. And nothing was changing. He was praying, he was hoping God would transform this and get, get out of this season. But the season wasn't changing. And so, and his friends were coming up against him, saying that he had some secret sin, and his kids sinned, and they deserved to die. All kinds of harsh things to him. On top of all the boils he had all over his body, and all the craziness that was going on in his life, his friends were throwing fuel on the fire. So he come to a point where he's pleading, pleading with God, that, like, I don't want to live anymore. Take me out of this. He was done. He was done. All right, before we go on, now let me just reiterate on this first verse. Job began to wallow in self-pity. How many of us go there? Mm -hmm. Poor me. I got to go through this. When we face battling, baffling affliction, listen now, okay? Our pain lures us towards feeling sorry for ourselves. That's what it does. Okay? At this point, we are only one step away from self-righteousness. Right? We're to keep, we're to keep track of life's injustices and say... Look what happened to me. It's so unfair. Look what happened to me. We may feel like blaming God. How many of us get to that point sometimes? Remember that life trials, whether allowed by God or sent by God, can be the means for development and refinement. When facing trials, think, what can I learn and how can I grow? That's the two things you have to say. When a trial comes, what can I learn and how can I grow rather than who did this to me and how can I get out of it? Amen. That is the spirit. See, the flesh, who did this to me and how can I get out of it? The spirit, 
What can I learn and how can I grow through this? See, now you welcome on the trial because you know God is sending that to you because nothing can happen unless God sends it into your life. And if you look at it with the right perspective, you have the opportunity to grow and change and transform. Can I get an amen here? Yeah. Either that, like I said, two things can happen when we go through things. We can get bitter or we can get better. So the whole idea, God isn't out to, to crush us. He's out to make us better. So we have to look at it in God's perspective saying, God is just trying to transform me and take some of the ugliness out of my soul and fill it with his spirit. And this is how he's going to do it. What can I learn from it? Instead of complaining and griping, I said, no reason to complain and gripe. You're going to heaven. I saved you. If you read what happened to Job, do we have any reason to gripe on anything down here? No, not at all. None of us even went to a smidgen of what he went through. All right, let's go to verse 2. Is that right with you so far? Yeah, let's pay attention. Okay. Verse 2. I will say to God, don't simply condemn me. Tell me the charge you are bringing against me. So Job is asking God, tell me what I did wrong. I demand a hearing on this. He's demanding something from God. What do you gain by oppressing me? He's really talking to God now. Why do you reject me, the work of your own hands, while smiling on the schemes of the wicked? Are your eyes like those of a human? Listen what he's talking Listen. He's talking to God here now. Do you see things only as people see them? Is your lifetime only as long as ours? Is your life so short that you must quickly probe for my guilt and search for my sin? Although you know I am not guilty, no one can rescue me from your hands. So Job, he did an evaluation on his life. He said, I find nothing that, that guilty enough for me to get go through this. And he didn't. I mean, he had pride in his heart, but nothing that, to a point of, he had complete integrity. Because God said, have you seen my servant Job? He is a man of complete integrity. He, he shuns evil and he does what is right. So God knew his character. So they were told Job didn't, definitely didn't. It was just, it was a test. That's what it was. It was a test. So we have to understand, every time we go through something, it's not always because we're sinning and doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to find that out is if you do an honest self-evaluation on yourself and say, how am I living? How am I behaving? Am I just reaping what I'm sowing? Or is God testing me and allowing me to grow? Either way, God is using it for good. So you're going to handle it the right way. So you have to look at it the right way. That's why we have to look at it through what? A spiritual lens. Now look at this in verse 8. You formed me with your hands and you made me. Yet, you, yet now you completely destroy me. Remember that you made me from dust. Will you turn me back to dust so soon? You guided my conception and formed me in the womb. <laughs> and curdled me like cheese. It's in Hebrew it says, you poured me out like milk and curdled me like cheese. <laughs> it says in 11, it says in 11, you clothed me with skin and flesh and you knit my bones and sinews together. So he knew that God created them. He knew that God was in control. You gave me life and showed me your unfailing love. My life was preserved by your care. Yet, your real motive, your true intent, was to watch me. And if I sinned, you would not forgive my guilt. So he thinking that God was watching every move he made. Just waiting for the right opportunity to to, to, to what get him. Mm -hmm. So we thought God was like a you know like a like a tyrant. You gave me this. You blessed my whole life. You gave me all these things, and then you were watching to see how I was going to act. And, and, and if I didn't act right, you were going to take it all off me and, and, and crush me. Mm -hmm. He thought that was the motive God had for His life, but that's not true. God says in His in His word that. I, I know the plans I have for you. Not a disaster, but a success. Mm -hmm. Right? 
Now listen, before we go on here. In frustration, now you can't blame Job here. Job jumped to the false conclusion that God was out to get Okay? Wrong assumptions lead to wrong conclusions. Ah. Marty did an awesome study on assumptions. How many times do we assume somebody's thinking something of us, or saying something about us, or talking about us, or doing something, assuming, or somebody says something about somebody, and you assume that it's the truth without getting the facts? That is the worst thing. Assumptions are worse without the facts. Just imagine uh, the court systems that was based on assumptions. Oh, boy. I assume that that guy's a rapist, so let's put him in jail. I assume I've seen him do something. I assume he, you know, when he was with that girl, he did something to her. And then they say, okay, is that what you think? Okay, go to jail. And he never touched her. No court system goes by assumption. Unless it's what? The facts are presented to the case. And it's the same thing in the spiritual life. We should never, never, never accept something as true. Without two or three witnesses, right? And to go before that person and say, you know, is this true what they're saying about you? Yeah. Because people gossip and slander people all the time in church. And they think there's nothing wrong with that. You really think that God is going to bless you for doing that? Please. If you don't have anything good to say as a Christian, keep your mouth shut. Or if you say something, say it because you love them and care about them. Not because you want to see them fail or assassinate their character. Any man. Sometimes you have to tell people the truth and that might hurt them. But it's because you love them and care about them that you say it. All right, listen. Wrong assumptions lead to wrong conclusions. We dare not take our limited experiences and jump to conclusions about life in general. If you find yourself doubting God, remember that you don't have all the facts. God wants what is best for your life. That is a fact. He says that in His Word. And He can use even the worst situations to accomplish His purposes. Many people endure great pain, but later find that some greater good ultimately came from it. Yeah, yeah. It ultimately transformed me. That trial, that 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 disaster, ultimately changed me from my core. If you handle it right, if people aren't taught right, though, with Christians, they won't walk away from God because all they're taught, oh, Jesus loves you. Yeah, Jesus loves you enough to correct you. And, and chasing you if need be to get you back in line. But I didn't do anything wrong. I'm a good person. No, you're not a good person. All of us sin. God says we all fall short of God's glory. The only good person is who? Jesus. Right. Don't think that highly of yourself because God will show you how, how not much of a good person that you're not. Put us in the wrong situation. We'll see how ugly we can really be. Amen, amen. amen. Like we can be a good person in church. Oh, hi, hi, brother, hi, sister, how you doing? <laughs> when you get to start, I'm like flipping off everybody on the road and cursing to get to church. I get an amen here. Amen. All right, let's be real. This is a real church. We're healing. It's a hospital for healing. Yes. We're healing from what? Our sin nature and our what? Mask. Mm -hmm. The mask we put on when we come to church. To take it off. Put on your new. Said, throw off your old sinful nature. Put on your new nature. Truly righteous. Created to be like God. Truly righteous and holy. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbor the truth. I do that. The truth is, yeah, I'm holding my life all the way to church today. That's why I said, yeah, but I love Jesus. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Listen. Many people do a great thing. When you're struggling, don't assume the worst. Don't assume the worst. All right, look at verse 15. If I'm guilty, too bad for me. And even if I'm innocent, I can't hold my head high because I'm filled with shame and misery. Oof. And if I hold my head high, you hunt me like a lion. 
and display your awesome power against me. Again and again, you witness against me. You pour out your growing anger on me and bring fresh armies against me. Do you notice, like, Job never, never mentioned that the devil could have been involved in any of this? Right, right. That's how sneaky the devil is. Job wow. was blaming God for everything. He didn't say that the devil might be behind this testing me. God using the devil. You know, he never mentioned the devil at all. You notice? He was, he was all talking about was God doing it all. When things go wrong in the world, where's God in all this? Where's God? Why did this happen? You know? Remember, we live in the devil's world. He says, I can do, he said to Jesus, it all belongs to me and I can do whatever I want with it. And I can give it all to you if you just worship me. So he has that kind of power in this world. But we have more power than him. Because we have Jesus. But we have to recognize that the, see, people don't recognize that the devil's behind everything out there. We blame people, we blame the president, we blame this, we blame that, we blame politics. It's the devil. He's behind the politics. He's behind putting that stuff in people's heads. He's the one controlled by puppets. Because when people want Jesus, they want God, they go to the Bible for their solution. Not anything else but. And that's not where the politicians go for their solutions. No. Okay. And if, look at look verse 16. If I hold my head high, you hunt me down like a lion and display your awesome power against me. Again and again, you witness against me. You pour all your growing anger on me and bring fresh armies against me. Why then did you deliver me from my mother's womb? Why didn't you let me die at birth? It would, it would be as tough it would be as though I never existed. Go directly from the womb to the grave. I have only a few days left, so leave me alone. Wow. Yeah, he's talking right. to God now. He's thinking, you know, he's talking to God. So leave me alone. That I might have a moment of comfort. Before I leave, never return for the land of darkness and other gloom. It is, a land, it is a land as dark as midnight and a land of gloom and confusion where even the light is dark at midnight. That's, he's talking about the state of mind he was in. Think about this is what he was in his mind. It was like, well, before I leave, never return for the land of darkness and utter gloom. It is as, as a land as dark as midnight, a land of gloom and confusion where even the light is dark as midnight. So even though he had the light of God and the light of God's word, it had no help. It didn't help him at all in this situation. He was depressed. He just wanted to die. It was all darkness for him. Does anybody ever get that doom and gloom feeling like there's no light? Even though we have all the light, all we see is darkness. And that's the schemes of the devil. He makes us see what's wrong all the time instead of what's right. If you think about it, by you just opening your eyes every morning is a blessing. He gave you another day of life. That is a blessing. We take it for granted and start complaining. Job said, why did we do that? Why, I wish, why did I die at birth? But he forgot all the good that God had already done for him. He was so prosperous. He had a beautiful family. Had everything taken care of. Most of his life, even if he was never going to get it back, he should be grateful for the things he already had. Yeah. No. The human heart. Never enough. All right. Let's go to, let's go to chapter 11. Okay. Moving right along here. Okay. So far, it's first response to Job. Now we got another one. So far. Mm -hmm. so now we're going to hear what he has to say. You notice, all of his friends all had something to say. None of them just kept their mouth shut. They all had to say something. Isn't that the human heart? We always gotta, we always gotta say something. We can't keep our big mouth shut when we're supposed to. Or we try to defend ourselves. 
What's that? What about me? What about me? What about me? <laughs> why do I go through this? Why do I go through this? I go to Bible study, I pray, I fellowship with other believers. Why am I suffering? I'm supposed to be getting blessed for this. Oh, so you did that so you could get blessed. You didn't do it because you wanted to do it and it was the right thing to do. Right. Ah, so maybe your motive was wrong after all. Because yeah. that's how God tests us. Yeah. So are you still going to follow me even though you're not going to derive anything from coming here? <laughs> There's been seasons of my life in ministry where I absolutely, in a desert place where nothing was happening and felt like I was in a pit. Over a year. But he said, are you still going to remain faithful to me? Because I called you, and I told you that I'd never leave you nor forsake you, so what are you going to do? Because everybody comes to that crossroad. Yep, absolutely. When you come to church, you say, why do you really get anything out of that? Why? Are you supposed to? Or were you here to what? Glorify God. Everybody comes here expecting to get something. How about coming to church expecting to give something? Maybe that will be the better motive. All right, look at verse 1. So far, Shrish responds to Job. Then so far, the Nehemiah replied to Job. Shouldn't someone answer this torrent of words? Is a person proved innocent just by a lot of talking? Should I remain silent while you babble on? When you mock God, shouldn't someone make you ashamed? You claim my beliefs are pure. I am clean in the sight of God. If only God would speak. If only he would tell you what he thinks. If only he would tell you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom is not a simple matter. Listen, God is doubtless punishing you far less than you deserve. Amen. Better than I deserve. In all the actuality, that's true. He gives us way less than we deserve. Can you solve the mysteries of God? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? Such knowledge is higher than the heavens. And who are you? It's deeper than the underworld, or Hebrew, the shield. What do you know? It is broader than the earth and wider than the sea. It almost sounds like he's God. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is how everybody is. They think they have God figured out, right? It's broader than the earth and wider than the sea. If God comes and puts a person in prison or calls the court to order, who can stop him? For he knows those who are false. And he takes note of all their sins. Oh boy. Mm. All right, before going on, let's just let's reiterate on that, on that verse. By referring to Job as faults, Saul Father was accusing him of hiding secret faults and sins. Okay? Although Saul Father's assumption was wrong, as usual, he explained quite accurately that God knows and sees everything. That's true. We are often tempted by the thought, no one will ever know. You know it as well as I do. When we do something in the dark, we think that nobody will ever find out. No, God is inside you. He already knows. Perhaps we can hide some sin from other people, but we can't hide nothing from God. Because our very thoughts are known to God, of course He will notice our sins. Job understood this as well as Zophar did, but it didn't apply to this current dilemma. We already know that God does that, but it wasn't, it wasn't applying to this situation. Okay? It wasn't because of his sins. Job wasn't getting tested because of his sins. He was getting tested because God said he was a righteous man with integrity, and the devil said, Surely if you take everything off you, he often will curse you to your face. And he never did. He never did. He never cursed God. He complained, but he never cursed God. His wife did. Why don't you just curse God and die? But then again, think of her. 
losing her kids and her family and her, and her, and, and their, and their um, means of making a living and all them things. So you can't go on judging her. How would anybody act in that situation? And she probably wasn't in tune with God as much as Job was. Now look what it says in verse 12. An empty-headed person won't become wise any more than a wild donkey can bear a human child. Or a wild male donkey can bear a tame colt. It's saying, it's saying an empty-headed person won't become wise any more than a wild donkey can bear a human child. What he's saying is you can't fix stupid. That's what he's saying. You can't fix it. That's what he's saying. If only you would prepare your heart and lift up your hands to him in prayer, get rid of your sins, and leave all iniquity behind you. So he's telling Job, you're going to get rid of your sins. This is why this is happening. See it? That's what he's saying. Get rid of your sins and leave all iniquity. And he's telling them to go lift your hands up there in prayer. Who says he has it already? Then your face will brighten with innocence. You will be strong and free of fear. You will forget your misery. It will be like water flowing away. Your life will be brighter than the noonday. Even darkness will be as bright as the morning. So he's going to go up and confess all his sins to God even though he doesn't have any to confess. So that's going to make him better. See, that's a wrong assumption right there. It doesn't apply to this situation. Context, context. Have, look at verse 18. Having hope will give you courage. You will be protected and will rest in safety. You will lie down unafraid and many will look to you for help. But the wicked will be blinded. They will have no escape. Their only hope is death. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Before we go on here, Zophar, okay, is the third of Job's friends to speak, and the least courteous one of them. Yes, okay. Full of anger, he lashed out at Job, saying that Job deserved more punishment, not less. Zophar took the same position as Eliphaz in Job four and five, and Bildad in Job eight. That Job was suffering because of his own sin. Same position. But Zophar's speech was far more, far the most arrogant out of all of them. Zophar was the kind of person who has the answer for everything. Oh, you ever meet that people? They have an answer for everything. He was totally insensitive to Job's unique situation. Some friend, right? All right, let's break into chapter 12. We're moving right along here, aren't we? Job's fought speech. Now he's going to respond to Zophar. Let's see what he has to say about this. <laughs> I like this part. This is good. Then Job spoke again. You people really know everything, don't you? <laughs> And when you die, wisdom will die with you. Well, I know a few things myself, and you are no better than I am. Amen. Who doesn't know these things you've been saying? Yet my friends laugh at me, for I call on God and expect an answer, and I am just as blameless uh, and I am a just and blameless man, yet they laugh at me. People who are at ease mock those in trouble. They do. <laughs> That's not the Christian behavior. Right? If somebody's if somebody's in trouble, we don't we're not at ease and mock those in trouble. They give a push to people who are stumbling. But robbers are left in peace. And those who provoke God live in safety. Though God keeps them in his power. Or those who try to manipulate God. <laughs> Look at verse 7. Just ask the animals, and they will teach you. Ask the birds of the sky, and they will tell you. 
Speak to the earth and it will instruct you. Let the fish in the sea speak to you. For they all know that my disaster has come from the hand of the Lord. He's saying all the parents and everything know that his disaster comes from the hands of the Lord. Look at it says in verse 10. For the life of every living thing is in his hand. You know that song? He's got the whole world in his hand. And that's true. He does. In the breath of every human being. So you know what? He has this. We don't know when we're going to live. We don't know when we're going to die. He knows exactly when we're going to breathe our last breath. That's how much. That's how much he knows. Wow. The ear tests the look at verse eleven. The ear tests the words it hears, just as the mouth distinguishes between foods. Wisdom belongs to the age, and understanding to the old. But true wisdom and power are found in God. Counsel and understanding are His. <clears throat> What he destroys cannot be rebuilt. When he says he's going to make something desolate, it remains desolate until he says it's not anymore. When he puts someone in prison, there is no escape. If he holds, the ba if he holds back the rain, the earth becomes a desert. If he releases the waters, they flood the earth. Yes, strength and wisdom are his Deceivers are in the seed are both in his power. Amen. So, like Claudia says, you're either a believer or a deceiver. So, there's people in, believe it or not, I know people don't like to hear this, but there's people in the church that are deceivers. They're not, just because they come to church does not mean they're Christians. The, the Bible tells us that the wheat and the tears are going to come grow together in the church. You can't, they're, they're so close together you can't determine which ones are. Because they all talk a good game, they say they read their Bible and love Jesus, and you can't tell if they're not. So we can't say, we can't judge any of them. We have to what? Let them grow together. Because if you pull off the weeds, you might upset some of the, the good. That's what he said, you uproot some of the wheat. That's right. Because you never know. So how do you know? Jesus said, you'll know my people by their fruit. By their actions and what comes out of their mouth. Look what it says in verse 17. He leads counselors away, stripped of good judgment. Wise judges become fools. He removes the royal robe of kings. They are led away with ropes around their waist. Now this is Job talking. So he knows God. He knows God's way. He leads priests away, stripped of status. He overthrows those with long years in power. Mm. Remember what he did with Nebuchadnezzar, right? Needs to come to an end. Yeah. <laughs> he silences the trusted advisor and removes the insight of the elders. <clears throat> he pours disgrace upon princes and disarms the strong. He uncovers mysteries hidden in darkness, and he brings light to the deepest gloom. He builds up nations and destroys them. He expands nations and he abandons them. He strips kings of understanding and leaves them wandering in a pathless way, a pathless wasteland. They grope in the darkness without a light. He makes them stagger like drunkards. So that was Job saying what he thinks how God works. Now. Is some of that true? I'm sure it is. But is it all true? I don't know. But most of, most of it that we know it is, he's the one who builds up nations. He's the one who destroys them. Remember, he, um, I think he was uh, Darius. He rose up Darius to conquer the Babylonians so they could rebuild the temple. He used an unbelief, and the, and the Jews were mad at him for, building, for, letting him, for bringing him to power. For doing it. God can bring anybody he wants to power. And his will is it's going to be accomplished in ways that we can't fathom. He'll use an unbeliever, a believer. He'll use the devil. He uses whatever he wants to accomplish his purposes. 
Like you said, the devil meant it for evil, but you meant it for me. He meant it for good. Remember Joseph? He said, you guys meant it for evil, but God knew he meant it for good. That was the only way I was going to get to Egypt. The way you did it is the only way I was going to get there. He would have never went any other way. He had to get sold into slavery to get there. Right? He was never going to go willingly. So that's, that's what he had to go through to get there. That was God's plan. And he knew it. All right, before we close, let's reiterate on what we just read. Job answered Zophar's argument with great sarcasm. Right? He said, wisdom will die with you. <laughs> he went on to say that his three friends didn't need to explain God to him. They were saying nothing he didn't already know. Okay? Job continued to maintain that his friends had completely misunderstood the reason for his suffering. Why didn't he just listen to Job and understood Look, I didn't do anything wrong. I don't know what it is. I must be getting tested. I don't know what it is. They would not just accept that. They had to figure out why. Job did not know the reason either. But he was certain that his friend's reasons were both narrow-minded and incorrect. Okay? Once again, Job appealed to God to give him the answer in chapter 13, verse 3. Right? Job affirmed that no leader has any real wisdom apart from God. Okay? No research or report can outweigh God's opinion. People go into what? Research and reports of the world cannot outweigh God's opinion. No scientific discovery or medical advances takes him by surprise. No computer or artificially intelligent robot catches him off guard. No innovative form of government or public policy makes him stop to think. When we look for guidance for our, own, for our decisions, listen now, we must recognize that God's wisdom is superior to any of the, any the world has to offer. Don't let earthly advisors dampen your desire to know God better. Mm -hmm. People want, the world has a, an answer for all this. But it ain't nothing to do with God. So where do we go? That's why we're here. We studied the Bible. We know why this is all happening. Because the Bible said it was going to happen. In the last days, people were going to turn away from the true faith. They were going to follow seducing spirits and doctrines of demons. And that's just what they're doing. Because even Christians are following that now. They're walking away from truth like God's not alive. Listen. A day is like, a, a thousand years is like a day to God. Yeah. We have to realize, no, it's going to take place. We just don't know when. But while we're waiting, we're going to get ready for when it does. Yeah, right. Instead of trying to figure out everything that's going to happen, he says, I want you to become like my son and build my kingdom down here okay. while we're waiting. Okay. I'll give you a purpose and a goal. Not to figure me out, to do what I ask you to do. The stuff that you can figure out to do that. Not to go any further with when the 70th year, the millennial reign, if he's going to come before, if we're going to get whisked out of here before, they're going to build some temple, they're going to raise some, some cows, get everything ready. That, all that is is a distraction, just like the news is a distraction from you becoming like Jesus. So that's what people do. They focus on all that. And forget the real reason why God called you. Not to figure that out, but to become like Jesus. Yep. Amen? Amen? All right, we're going to close there. Dave, you want to come up and close us in prayer, and we're going to put your video.
them that you saved them and that you live them always. We pray this in the holy precious name. Amen. 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 Amen.